All right, thank you very much. In a speaking task, generally in IX speaking task, I usually divide my teaching into three. I will always love to look at the nature of the speaking task, the structure of the speaking task, and also the grading in speaking task. As regards the structure, the nature uh, of speaking task, I'm sure you can hear me now. Please, can I get a response? Can you hear me? Yes. We can okay. hear you very well. Loud All, right, clear. All right, thank you very much. Thank okay. you very much. So the first thing I will look at is the nature of speaking task. And I will love a situation where you don't just see this as mere um, uh, Zoom talk. You can put some things down if need be so that you won't forget. Because from next week, by the grace of God, from next Saturday, we'll move fully into the practical class. And we only have two Saturdays left. And those two Saturdays will be dedicated to full practical. And uh, we'll be doing it actually, we'll be using um, a marker as the case may be to observe our speakings and to assess us directly on Zoom. So I want you to bear all this in mind. Like I said, the nature of IX speaking task. IX speaking task is a formal conversation. When I say conversation, ordinarily you look at conversation as probably informal. You talk, teach chats, talk to your friend, talk to your boss, talk to it. But here it is a formal speaking endeavor, a formal conversation. Why am I using that formality? It's formal in the sense that you're not expected to use other language than English language. You're not expected to um, incorporate vulgar language in your responses. You're not even expected to be too colloquial in your responses, in your usage of English language. So these are the things that actually make IELTS speaking a formal, conversation. And there are certain things actually that will happen in the speaking lab. And uh, those things, when they happen, you, you, you tend to want to give attention to them. Actually, they don't concern you, but you tend to give attention to them. And the moment you give attention to those things, you distract yourself. So I always advise that when you are in speaking lab, you concentrate on why you are there. If any gadget is malfunctioning or misfunctioning, then it is not your issue. It's gonna be the issue of the technical crew or the examiner in that environment. So you wouldn't bother yourself about that. All you need to do is to enter the speaking lab with courtesy and allow your examiner to offer you seats before you take your seats. If you greet, you exchange pleasantry and your examiner is still doing something that probably he hasn't looked up to your face and saying, oh, please, you're welcome, sit down. Then remain standing. It's formal, it's cautious. It's just a matter of courtesy. And uh, it demands that you are formal and you are respectful. Having said that, let me tell you that part of the nature, all those things that culminate into the nature of speaking parts is actually uh, the face-to-face -face encounter, face-to-face -face thing with your examiner. And that's why I always invite Zoom to take our speaking class because I want to see your face when I'm asking you a question. And um, you want to see my face as a pro tem examiner or a pseudo examiner, as the case may be. Um, Abimbola, Abimbola said, my voice is fluctuating. Please, it must be the network from your end, please. Kindly check the network from your end, all right? So it's a face-to-face -face encounter with your examiner. I always advise our candidates, don't let the examiner's face scare you. 
No, your examiner is not God. He's also a human being. And because he's also a human being, you respond to your examiner like a human being. Don't forget, your examiner is only out to measure your competence in English language, not your facial, not the way you look, not, how, not really how beautiful you are or you look or how handsome you look in the speaking lab, no. As a matter of fact, you can be responding to some questions and be smiling while your examiner is not smiling at all. So if you give such an attention, it's possible you get distracted. But like I always say, part of those things that um, come together to form the nature of speaking task is also empathy. What I call empathy, E-M-P-T-H-Y. What do I mean by empathy? When you're asked any question, there is a particular emotion behind that question. And that emotion, you as candidate, you attach that emotion to your response. It goes a long way in convincing your examiner that you actually understand the question. Having said that, empathizing will actually take you when you are asked question about accidents or probably you rescue some accident victims or your experience with certain accident victims or probably either domestic or external accidents, then you have to respond as candidates. You are respected to attach the emotion behind that rescue operation to your response. Of course, what do I mean? You can be giving response to such question and be smiling. You can be remembering a day that you had a counter with accident victim and you'll be clapping your hands, you are, you're actually excited. No, you are remorseful. You are, you are, you're painting a picture to your examiner as if your examiner was there that day that the thing happened. So you empathize. Unlike when you are asked a question about your last birthday celebration or how your husband or how your wife celebrated your birthday, your last birthday for you, then you won't be expected in such situation to, to be remorseful or to be showing a kind of regret or to probably be displaying emotion that doesn't go with that question because that question actually has to do with celebration. It actually has to do with you enjoying your birthday celebration. So it should be with excitement. I want you to bear this in mind. Yes, while talking about the nature too, let me mention this. Although I will still mention it when I'm talking about the grading. You need to generate enough idea. And somebody will say, this man has come again with this idea generation. Yes. It is the pivot, the pillar of every speaking or writing endeavor. You need to generate enough idea. If you don't have enough idea, you won't have anything to develop. The way we have it in writing, we also have idea generation in speaking. But in the case of speaking task now, it may not really be as, um, as, um, as, as, as immediate or, sorry, as a, as a uh, uh, relaxing as that of writing tasks. You know, in writing tasks, we say whatever comes to your mind first, you'll be putting them down. And when you're putting them down, you just generate enough of those points and try to recategorize them into points with which you used to write. You highlight them, how they're going to link together, how those points will be developed. Then you form your opinion through that. That's writing. But here in, in, in speaking, we actually have certain justice that will follow, that give us immediate idea that we can always talk about in speaking task. Number one, when you are asked any question in speaking task, if it's not chit chat question, yes or no question, or probably question that has to do with um, you talking about um, your personal self or your personal life domestically, your background and all those stuff, if 
there are questions that has to do with topical issues. For example, you're talking about environmental law, you're talking about tourism, you're talking about art and crafts, you're talking about design, you're talking about challenges, life challenges. Then you begin to think towards this direction or these three directions that I'm gonna give you. Number one, you can think in line of advantage or disadvantage. If you are asked any question, you know, immediately your mind goes off. Where do I get what to say about this question? Okay, is it a question that has to do with any advantage, any disadvantage of that question? Something will drop into your mind if actually that question goes along that line. Number two, causes and effects. Number one, I said advantage, disadvantage. Number two, cause and effect, or if you like, causes or uh, effects. In this uh, second one again, if advantage, disadvantage doesn't go with that topic or with that thing that you're taking, a uh, topic you are given to respond uh, to, you quickly think also in the direction of cause and effect. Okay, is it a particular topic that's having anything to do with cause? Okay, is there cause? Is there effect? Okay, if I'm given questions like, okay, I should talk about tourism, for example. Tourism, is it having any cause? No, of course, it may not have cause. It may be natural, natural cause. Okay, what about the effect of tourism? Yes, tourism can have effects, especially when it is well developed. Okay, I'm having ideas already. I'm generating, okay, there can be advantages of tourism in every society. Okay, is there any disadvantage? Okay, I can always mention a few disadvantages when I begin to explain uh, tourism or probably my personal experience in tourism. Then you have idea to talk about. Number three, I always talk about problem solution. Okay, problem solution in the sense that is it a topic that is problematic, requiring solution? Or is it a topic that is actually you are, you are even expected, you can actually identify problems as regard that topic, and you can actually identify solutions as regard that topic. So by the time you think through these three areas, it is possible that you have enough ideas to talk about, at least one, but I'm sure in most cases, more than one, like about two of these three would be useful for you, the effects, advantage disadvantages or the effects problem solution or the cost then the problem then the solution you know you can be given a question like hiv aids hiv aids and probably you are to talk about hiv aids of course in that situation you can talk about the cost of hiv aids you can talk about the effects of hiv aids you can talk about the Solution, problem solution to HIV AIDS. It's possible to apply more than one, more than two of all this um, justice. You apply them to generate your idea. So far, if there are questions, please let me know now. Just raise up your hand electronically and let me know if there are questions so far so that we wouldn't waste our time. But if there are no questions, just wave your hands. If there are no questions, you can just send into the chat box. Okay, just send okay into the chat box. If there are no questions, if you don't have questions, just send okay. But if you have questions, just raise your hand up electronically. Okay, okay, okay. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello, sir. Yes, hello. Uh Please, I couldn't hear the third point, sir. The third point, problem solution. Yes, sir. Problem solution. You know, the first one we said advantage, disadvantage. The second one, cause and effect. The third one, problem and solution. Thank you, sir. All right. You can mute your microphone. All right, let, we can go ahead now. I think majority. We can go ahead now. Let's move to the structure, the structure of speaking task. Here 
you have to practice. There are three parts officially in speaking task. You can put down your hands, grace, uh, grateful. Grateful heart, please put down your hands. The same style you used to raise the hand up, you can put it down, all right? So the structure, officially we have three parts. The part one, taking about three minutes. And usually this part one is um, most times based on personal things, personal domestic things about you. I was talking about the three parts. Uh, part one, the chit chat parts with your examiner about your personal life, about um, those things that are very peculiar to you alone. Uh, they may be asking you a question about the school you attended, maybe asking you a question about your home, domestic questions um, that you can easily respond to and um, that won't give you issue. Let me tell you this from here now, that anytime when your examiner asks you a question, your examiner doesn't have control over the response that you're going to give. Yes, he's looking forward to getting response from you, but he doesn't have control over that response. You have, hello, is anyone disturbing us here again? Okay, you have control over the, the response. So you're free to attack that question in a way that can draw the attention of your examiner. Let me give you a very good example. If I'm asked a question about, oh, Mr. Samuel, you're welcome. Which primary school did you attend? Oh, thank you very much. I attended Baptist Primary School, so, so, and so, so, and so. Oh, during your primary school days, did you have any teacher then that was actually so impressive in his teaching style? And you want to say, oh yes, there was this man called um, Mr. Adekola. Mr. Adekola was actually a native of so so and so so and so. And, uh, well, and I took something from Mr. Adekola. You see the way I was responding to that question. I did not go directly as if Mr. Adekola taught me directly. I was saying, I took something from Mr. Adekola right from that time. And that thing actually became part of me up to today. You know, I've not really talked much about Mr. Nicola before saying I took something from him. You know, it depends on how versed you are to actually captivate, to get the attention of your examiner to yourself. When you say, I, took, I actually took something from Mr. Nicola, then your examiner wants to know what you have actually taken from Mr. Nicola before you begin to respond and you now talk about Mr. Nicola. And your examiner may cut you in to say, oh, okay, okay, thank you very much. But this Mr. Nicola, was he still at the school till you graduated or till you finished uh, from that school? You say, oh, he actually left when I was in primary four. And all so Nick, that, that's the type of question you find in your part one. And like I said, it will take like um, three minutes, three, four minutes. The whole speaking exercise is going to be 15 minutes. And uh, your part two, your part two usually is the cue card part. What do I mean by the cue card? Your examiner is going to give you a, a sheet of paper. And on that sheet of paper, you have a question, the idea that he or she wants you to talk about there. And under that, Top question that you'll be asked, you see like three points or four points, three to four points. We call those things, that thing, cue cards. Those are the things that will give you the clue as to the type of response that you are to give. Make sure in your cue card question, make sure you touch on those areas that have been, that have been highlighted for you to talk about. Don't omit any. Because at this point, your examiner is going to offer you plain sheets or probably a piece of paper. And we ask you, would you like to jot some things down within a few seconds? Because when you start to talk, your examiner will not interrupt. And don't forget that your speaking endeavor is recorded right from the onset to the final word. Don't forget. 
Do you understand? So in your cue card, make sure you're not leaving anything out in your cue card. The last part, and this is just for like, again, like three minutes. Like I said, the old speaking endeavor is like 15 minutes. So the last part, you will take another four minutes to three to four minutes again. All this, the regulation of this time depends on your examiner. He has the lazity to stop you at any point. The moment he is satisfied or he feels that he wants to stop you because you can, you can end up using 13 minutes, 14 minutes before your examiner and that's no problem at all. So the last part where you can be asked academic questions, social question, you can be asked to develop a particular topic and talk about it extensively and uh, on your own. So this is very, very important. These are the few things you should know about structure. Having said all this, there is a particular section that will usually come before all these three parts. And we call that the greeting and ID check period. Right from the greeting, as in when you're coming into the lab and you're exchanging pleasantry with your examiner, your examiner starts to greet you. Your examiner starts to observe whatever you say. So don't forget, please, this Zoom is gonna go off after 40 minutes. If it goes off, we're coming with the same address, please. Thank you very much. So like I said, don't, you just try and make sure that right from greeting and ID check, where your examiner is asking you to display your passport, he's asking you to talk about your name, your background, where you're coming from and all those stuff, your examiner starts to greet you. Let me tell you this. In your speaking lab, your examiner greets you directly. After God, it's your examiner. So you see your examiner writing when you're talking. Eight, seven, six, seven, eight, nine, seven. And at the end of the day, he will divide and give you your average band. Thank you very much. Let me move into grading. Let me move into grading. There are four criteria with which we grade in I speaking tasks. Number one, cohesion and fluency. Number two, grammar. Number three, vocabulary. Number four, pronunciation. Number one, fluency and cohesion. I won't spend much time on cohesion because I've actually taken it in the class last, uh, time in writing. Those things I've said in writing class apply also in speaking task. Don't forget. So if you need any notes on cohesion, kindly check those things that we have in our writing class. Since we're, we were all there, you can always read over. But fluency, influency. I always want candidates not to speak like American, not to be speaking like Canadian or Australian. No. Your examiner is actually aware that you are a second language user of English language. So speak like a second language user, but make sure that you flow. That's the fluency. Let your expression flow from beginning to the end with minimal mistakes. There are certain mistakes that are unavoidable, but let your examiner know that, oh, that will be a mistake, not an error. There's a difference between mistake and error. When you keep on saying the same thing and it's a mistake, then we say it's an error. But when you make a particular mistake, you can always correct it and say the correct thing. That's a mistake. So let your examiner know that whatever mishap that happened will probably be a mistake. And you can always repair your mistake. Please, you can always repair your mistake. If you made a mistake and you actually know the correct thing, you can always go back to that thing and restate that expression again to show that you actually know the correct thing. Um, that's fluency. You let it flow. Oyinyechi, please, can you unmute your microphone and quickly ask your question so that you put down your hand? Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Is on the structure of speaking task. Yes. I got the first one, which is the personal question, the chit chat life, and yes. also the second one, which is the cue card part. Yes. Then the third yes. one is what I didn't get. Is the academic? It's purely academic. Academic topic or social topic. And you'll be asked to talk about okay. it on your, you have to develop the idea on your own, although it will be very short, three, four minutes. No, I think it's two, between two and three minutes. Then you write that one minute question from your examiner can come up. 
Do you understand? Thank you very much. All right, put down your hands. So like I was saying, that's fluency. You let it flow. Number two is grammar. I'm gonna take grammar class on Monday by the grace of God in writing uh, on, our, on our WhatsApp in writing. So I want you to pay attention. Whatever I have on Monday for grammar, it's also what I will have said today. So let's bear it in mind. I always limit my teaching on grammar to teaching of tense and teaching of number. What do I mean by tense? Past and present tense. What do I mean by number? Singular and plural. There are certain rules that guide your expression. When you have, in the case of tense, when you use past tense, verb past tense, first in a sentence, all other verbs in that sentence must be in past tense. When you use present tense, first, all other verbs in that same sentence will, will be in present tense. There are situations where you, you use future tense, especially in speaking task. Future tense will, will, will happen. Then all others will be in future or present tense. Like I was saying, grammar. I'm going to treat grammar on Monday by God's grace, tense and number. So don't forget this. It, it's actually relevant, most relevant in speaking and writing task. Then um, vocabulary. Mentor Shade is taking us through vocabulary, but I think you can always develop yourself. You actually need to develop yourself in this direction. Uluwa Kemi, Uluwa Kemi, can you please ask your question? You're raising up your Thank hand. You. Yes. Uh, we are told on the group that we should uh, discuss with our examiner about if we have any speech deficiency. For somebody like me, I talk very fast. So do I have to tell the person that I talk fast so he, he, can, he or she can understand me? Okay, put down your hands. Speech deficiency, I'm not really sure whether it involves speaking fast. Stammerer or some people, maybe because of certain um, misnomer in their speech organs. Some people maybe because of their tongue, or because of their teeth or pain in the oral cavity, then it's possible that they're not able to speak fluently. Those are the ones that I think uh, should notify the examiner. But for like somebody like you, even the way you have spoken now, you did not even speak fast at all. All you just need to do is probably to take your time. Just drag yourself a bit when you are responding. I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. Thank you very much. So, um, vocabulary. I always have this tip when, I, when I'm talking about vocabulary. And what's the tip? Try as much as possible to learn at least, at least between five and 10 words. Pick up your dictionary. Don't be too big or bigger than your dictionary. You can be bigger than your dictionary. You can know more than your dictionary. Pick up your dictionary, bring out about five to 10 words. They are not common words, but they are English words. Bring them out. Know the meaning, know the appropriate usage of those words. What do I mean by appropriate usage? Know when you can use them as noun, know when you can use them as adjective, Know when you can use them as verb. Know when you can use them as adverb. Know when they don't have other variety. Maybe it's only noun that you can derive from it. If it's going to be adjective, you cannot derive adjective, you cannot derive adverb from it. There are words like that. Learn the appropriate usage of, of those words. And then make sure that um, you patronize them. What do I mean? Patronize those words not only in speaking in, in, on your exam day now. Try to use them now, even now. Begin to use them at home. Let somebody ask you, uh -uh, your grammar is much. What's, what's the meaning of that word? Then gladly tell the person, oh, the meaning is that it's so, 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 and so. Let it be part of you. Use those words and let people ask you questions. When, you when those words are actually part of you and you patronize them, you discover that before long, 
when you're responding in your speaking task, you tend to imbibe one or two from those words. And I'm sure the moment you, the moment you talk about, you use words like that, the moment you use about three or four words in your speaking task that are not common English words, and you use them appropriately, I assure you, within 15 minutes, you're going to get your appropriate score in vocabulary. So that's just my tip and shortcut to vocabulary. There's no shortcut to it, no appropriate usage. You deploy some uncommon words in English language that will give your examiner impression that you're actually competent in the use of English language. The last thing I want to talk about is pronunciation pronunciation. This is very, very important. I used to have this problem too. And I'm sure like many of us in English speaking country or English as a second language user country, we used to have this problem, pronunciation. Now, what is the problem? How do we pronounce correctly? How do we know the correct pronunciation of a particular word in English? There is no shortcut. Make use of your dictionary. English language is a language of stress and intonation. And because English language is a language of stress and intonation, it gives us problem if we want to pronounce words in English language, because our own native languages, Yoruba, Hausa, Igbo, our own native languages are actually tone languages. They are not stress and intonation language or languages. They are tone languages. And because they are tone languages, is Doremi, because is Doremi, they are tone languages, we tend to bring up the tenets of those languages into our rendition of English language, which will be very wrong. And that is why some of us will find it difficult to pronounce certain sounds in English language because they are not attested to in our mother tongue. Let me give you a very good example. An Oshobo lady, I'm sure you are here now. Yeah, you, you can hear me. Some of them are here. An Oshobo or Osho State lady will not be able to pronounce, even Ibadan, will not be able to pronounce favor correctly. They may not be able to pronounce various correctly. They will say various. They will say faithful. When you ask them to pronounce words like a, Ask Ibadan lady or Ibadan boy to pronounce solution. Solution. What, you, what will you hear? You hear solution or shaky boy. Solution. You hear a, a source. They are pronouncing such, such, such people. They want to say such people. You, they are pronounced church. They say church. They will say source. Whereas an equity man will say shosh, shosh. And the correct pronunciation of that word is church, church. These are the ways that your mother tongue may affect the rendition of English language. And if care is not aching, you mispronounce such words. Um, having said that, you hear Igbo lady calling development, development, uh, the, instead of the, the, the people or the development. You hear Alsa, Alsa guy saying government, not government. They will say government. They will say very, very, instead of very, very. They will say people instead of fifu. Uh, they will say fifu instead of people. These are the ways that 
our mother tongue will always come in to the rendition of our English language. So these are the ways that your mother tongue will always come into the rendition of English language. But you have to be very careful, be conscious, identify your own area of weakness, and be conscious while pronouncing uh, words in that direction. Ever since I knew myself, I'm a Nikiti boy. So I have always cautioned myself whenever I want to pronounce CH in English language, I'll say church. Any group, okay, problem. Okay, okay, as in problem, any group people. Grace, thank you very much. <laughs> so we have peculiarities. Some of us, we have peculiarities like that. Call a Ibom, tell a Ibom lady to call um, champion, champion. You hear Yambion. Please mute your microphone. You hear Yambion, you won't hear champion. And that same word in the kitty, we say champion, champion. And for, and he's saying, he say lady, you say champion. Or your state, you say champion. So we have peculiarities like that. We have peculiarities like that. But all you need to do is to be conscious when you're pronouncing those words. Be conscious of correct pronunciation. Somebody is disturbing my class. So please. And I think I did not allow you to meet. So I wouldn't know how you have you came up with that uh, noise. Anyway, please just adjust. Make sure you meet your microphone. All right, having said all that, English language is a language of stress and intonation. Stress, we mean primary stress, secondary stress, or words. But when it is on stretch of utterance, more than words, then you say intonation. There are certain ways you use expression and it will mean question without even putting question mark. Of course, you know in speaking, there's no way you want to be putting question mark or punctuation. So bear it in mind. Two people are conversing, and some speaker A says the primary stress and the secondary stress. I was saying, I, then in intonation, I said there are certain expressions you give, and it will depict question. Even though you are not putting question mark, of course, in speaking task, there's no way you're going to put punctuation. Let me give you a very good example. Speaker A and speaker B, they are talking. Speaker A says, "You are stupid." And speaker B is responding, I am stupid. Of course, it is because of that intonation, the rising tone in the intonation that makes us to know that, oh, the response of speaker B is actually a question. I am stupid. Then it will require speaker A to confirm yes or no. Yes, you are stupid. No, you are not stupid. So that tells you that even mere intonation, we give our expression the color of whether it is a question or a declarative statement or an emphasis, or you're probably confirming something. You are stupid. I am stupid. Yes, you are stupid. You know, you are stupid. Come on to those three expressions, but they actually give different meanings. So in your speaking task, be very careful when you're using intonation. When you use intonation up, you may be asking questions if care is not taken. And you know, you can be throwing questions back at your examiner. I want you to get that one straight. When your examiner asks you questions, you are not asking questions back. Why are you, are you, you, do you expect me to talk about this? When your examiner is saying, talk about environmental laws in your, in, your, in your society, in Nigerian society. And you are saying, oh, I should talk about environmental law in Nigerian society. Why are you asking that question? Why are you responding question with question? Don't show your examiner that you're always a Nigerian, please. It's not formal. When you ask question, just to respond. In English language, we have two types of stress. We have the primary stress. We have the secondary stress. The primary stress is actually on syllable that is taking the highest pitch, the highest pitch in a particular word. Let me give you a very good example. Exports. In exports, there are two syllables. 
In English language, you are having two uh, types of stress, the primary and secondary. And like I said, the primary stress is the one that is, is the syllable that is having the highest pitch. And I'm using exports as an example. In exports, there are two syllables. Exports. Those are the two syllables. T, Ch. Those are the two syllables. Comforts. Those are the two syllables. Rachel is different from grace. That's just one syllable. Strength. That's one syllable. But when you say Rachel, comfort, export, then X is taking the highest pitch. And that tells you that the primary stress is on the X port. And in English language, there are certain words that can come in form of noun and verb. If care is not taken, if you mispronounce, it's possible that you don't send the correct signal to your examiner. Exports, of course, when the primary stress is on the first syllable, you know that that's now. Exports, that same word, exports. Of course, you know that that's verb. When the primary stress falls on the second syllable, then it is a verb. Yeah, as a matter of fact, stress on verb is always on the last syllable. Intricates, explicates, always on the last syllable when you're using that word as verb. But when it's now and they are having, and it's just two syllables, then the primary stress will be on the first syllable. Exports, that's now. Exports, that's verb. Now, in a situation where you mean not verb, you actually mean verb, and you are pronouncing Adeni, Adenika, you have come again. Please meet your microphone. <laughs> like I said, you, you actually want to use verb. Exports before your examiner, and you're using exports. I want to export my goods. Your examiner, you are sending a wrong signal to your examiner. You're not going to get the score of pronunciation in that environment. I want to export my goods, not I want to export my goods. I'm sending an export. Yes, yeah, very correct. Not I'm spend, sending some exports. No. So your pronunciation has a way of affecting the way you render your expressions in English language. I'm sure you understand what I'm saying, uh, Grace. Yes, sir. All right, yes, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very sir. much. If you have any other question, please raise up your hand. On this note, I want to appreciate, okay, I'm having Olufemi Adeni around. Please unmute your microphone and ask your question. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Yes, sir. Please, uh, my question is from the example that you cited. Okay. That we should talk about the environmental law okay. in our country. Okay. In that case, Yes. Are we good to start by defining the environmental law or we should just start mentioning those laws? Okay. I'm just asking about how we are going to start in that case. In such question, in such question, you can define environmental law before you begin to give examples of environmental law. If I were you, if I define and I, I have given an example and it's like I still have time, the examiner is not stopping me. I'm going to give I'm going to talk about the advantages. I'm going to talk about disadvantages. I'm going to talk about the solution that such laws are actually offering in our society. The advantage in our society, the effect of such law on our society. Do you understand what I'm saying now? So you are free to define yes, sir. and give example. As a matter of fact, I always advise people okay. when you tackle a particular question and it's like you are stuck, you don't know where to go again, be given example. You can give more than one example. After one, the first example, and you still have time, you say, likewise, there was another day, I remember I was at so and so place when I was doing so and so and so, and it happened that I was, you begin another example, another story from there, and you'll be able to explore your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. All right.